I wanted to follow up from the end of the previous video where we were running into problems with connectivity on the the ping test that we were doing. So I was able to find the problem. What I did was, and it was li literally as soon as I stopped the recording, I go, oh, wait a minute, I didn't bounce the NICs. So um, every once in a while, you have to take the network adapters of the VMs and you have to flap them. So what I did was, as I went into one device, and that's exactly what I did. I just disconnected the network adapter, reapplied it, and then I did that for the entire range. So if I go over here to Windows 1, um, if I go in here and I ping the gateway, I can ping the gateway, which is what you'd expect. Let me go ahead and get out of the way. And then if I ping 12, and obviously now it's not going to work. <laughs> of course it won't. Um, then you ping uh, 13, 13 pings. Uh, then we have 14. Let's see, that should this should be 14. Yeah, so it's kind of weird how they. Let me go back to two, and um, that fixes that usually fixes the problem. So if I go to back to this guy, yeah, 14 is not responding for some reason. Uh, you know what? I bet you I didn't set a default gateway on this guy. So let me go open the console here, open remote console. I don't. I may have to reboot 12. So if I come in here and type in the password, one too many S's in password. A lot of times you have to go through and just make sure the config is correct. Okay, so here we have that. So I'm gonna do a uh, go click on the network icon, edit network connections. And then we're gonna click right here, edit. And then go to the IPv4 settings. Yeah, that's the problem, there's no gateway. 172.31.100.1 and then I'm gonna give it a quad eight gateway. There are quad eight DNS, because eventually we will get DNS working close so we go back over here to this guy and I hit 14 14 should respond now let me go over here and uh, if config let me ping 172.31.100.1 okay I can ping that I can ping 101 network is unreachable okay so this is one of those other situations where you have to um, same thing with Linux 2, which is right here. So I'll stay on Linux 4 for the moment. So you can go to here, go to manage virtual machine settings. Oh, you know, this isn't going to let me do it because it's not managed at the VM level. It's managed at vCenter. So if we come back over here. We go actions, edit settings. We'll go ahead and connect it. Click OK. We'll disconnect it. Well, I, sorry, I did the wrong box. Then we'll actions, edit settings, connected, click OK there. We'll do the same thing for four. Actions, edit settings, connected, OK. Sometimes you have to wait, or you should wait a couple seconds for it to trigger here. So the virtual machine will get the update. And there it did. It got the update right there. So now I'm going to go back to actions, edit settings. Click on connected, click OK, click back on Linux 4, the connection is established. Now I can ping my other gateway address and then I should be able to ping uh, 12. That should be working. Destination host is unreachable. That's awesome. So if I go back to here and I ping 14, but that that's working. So, uh, we at least we know that's usually how you fix that problem. If I hit the up arrow and go 12, 12 is responding now. So sometimes they just time out, um, so and so forth, so on and so forth. So if I go 15, I know 15 is not going to work because the gateway is not updated. So I'm gonna actually I'm gonna cancel that one. I'm gonna do an updated ping. I'm gonna do a dash t, and then I will uh, click on 15. We'll go ahead and I'm gonna. See if I can bounce the NIC before I change the, the gateway address. 
See if that makes a difference. Okay, now I'm going to right click here, edit settings, or I'm sorry, open remote console. And we're trying to ping. We're going to wait for the connection. So when you get something like this, if it doesn't pop up right away, more than likely you've got to, uh, we can see that there's a green arrow. For, there's a green play button right here. Um, you may have to go to here, uh, power and restart the guest. So I'm actually going to go ahead. So it's going to initiate guest restart. I'm going to just reboot the virtual machine. So now that I've sent that, you can power it off too. That would work as well. But you get the, the, the VMs hang every once in a while. Let me go do this guy real quick because he's in the overlay as well, I believe. Yeah, he's on the overlay as well. Let me go ahead and bounce his nick real quick. and then add it back. So this is some troubleshooting scenarios you might have to deal with when you're in the real world. Uh, I'm also, like I've mentioned a couple times in the past, I am also actively working on the VCAP deploy and VCAP design for NSX. So for me, this is a both a real world scenario that I might run into as well as a um, in the lab I might run into this okay so this is I'm gonna go ahead and just power I'm gonna go ahead and just pull the power on this guy Linux 6 is not pulling up the remote console I'm just gonna power this guy off power off. This is like pulling the plug out of the back. There it goes. Okay, so Linux 6 is finally pulling up. Okay, let's go ahead and log into him real quick. And Linux, when Linux 5, we'll go ahead and power on. Just like that. Linux 6, we're logged in. We're going to go ahead and edit the connections. And I didn't give these guys default gateways before, so that's why I'm doing it now. And you run into problems when sometimes when you don't do things ahead of time, but no, here's no gateway. 172.31.100.1 quad 8 as my DNS server. Save. Close. And if I go back over here to Windows 1 and I open up another connection command prompt and I do a ping to 172.31.100.16-t we'll go and double check on that config because I'm getting request timed out let's see here I have config We'll go ahead and ping 172.31.100.1. I can ping my gateway. Can I ping the remote gateway? Okay, when you see this, this is still an, uh, this is still an issue with the network adapter. So I'm going to go back over here, edit settings, bounce it. I wasn't sure if that would actually work, but now that I've got the, the OS in front of me, I can look at the actual adapter. Sometimes it doesn't flush. They're flushed. Now I'm going to be able to go back in here and reapply it. Get that to go. Pull up Windows. There it goes. Now it's responding. And that's what you would expect. So you actually have to get the, the NIC and the OS to talk to each other. So we're going to go ahead and is the open console here. Yep. Yeah. So There it goes. So it's coming back online. Okay, good. So I'm just going through this at this point just to make sure that everything is working the way we expect it to. We should be able to log in. We'll do a quick ping, make sure it's working. Um, I do have Windows 1 ping in 15. 
we may have to go ahead and stop this ping because we now we know we have intersegment routing and all that good stuff that goes along with it. So I'm gonna go back to five. He's booting up for the first time or rebooting, I should say. So it'll take a few minutes for this to trigger, and then once it does, we'll be able to log in. I'm, I'm gonna quick pause and wait till the OS comes back online. Okay, it took a couple minutes for it to come online. We can see the ping is not responding. We can go in here. We can click the edit connections. I still need to set the default gateway. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. And then we'll set that. We'll go down here, set the DNS server. Click on save and close. Okay, now that we've got that, I'm gonna open up a terminal. And we're probably still gonna have to flap the neck. So ping 172.31.100.1. I can ping on my segment, but if I go to 101.1, .1, I have that problem. So edit settings, we're gonna flap the neck. Okay. So that fall that fixes that problem. We're gonna go ahead, just double check the, the OS. OS is responding appropriately. Edit settings, go back. Obviously this would be a pain in the neck to deal with if you were doing it one by one, you had 100 VMs to do. There is another way of doing this. You can go to here and you can go to the overlay and you can right click here and say migrate VMs to another network and then choose another network to send them to and an attempt to trigger the NICs to do that. So um, it's very rare for me to have this problem on a regular basis, but every once in a while it does happen and usually it's just a NIC flap that you need to do. So we're gonna go ahead and go back over here to five and hit the up arrow. I should be able to ping that IP, which I can, and I should be able to ping 11, which is Windows 1. So I can ping that way, and then Windows 1, and now my pings are responding. So they started responding about a minute ago. So they were, as you can see, they were pinging, timing out for a long time. So everything's good to go now. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is basically how you would fix that problem. Now, I also want to mention that over here on Linux 1, we're never going to be able to talk to it because it's attached to VLAN 100. And right now, the way we have our routing set up, None of our Linux VMs that are attached to the overlay segment and none of the Windows VMs that are attached to the Windows overlay will be able to talk outbound. And the reason why, if I bring up my topology, the reason why is because as far as we've taken this is getting the overlay segments connected to a gateway and we've installed a default gateway on when you apply the IP address to the segment and then you connect it to a gateway, that is when you have inter-segment routing. So the next thing I have to go do is I, basically I just have inter-segment routing set up in the ESXi environment, but I don't have any outside connectivity. The next step in that process is to connect, which we've already done in the previous video, I did show you guys how to do that. The next step in the process is to set up VLAN back segments to both edge nodes to both CSRs. Now what I'm going to go do is I am going to, one of the things that I did on the CSRs is the troubleshooting step is I shut down gig two on CSR two. And so what I would do long term, and that the reason I did that was for the transported VLANs for the communication between the ESXi host via the overlay. So let me go ahead and re revisit that real quick just to show you what I mean. So if I go back over here to NSX, I go to System. I go to Fabric. I go to Profiles. And I go to Uplink Profiles. You'll notice right here that I have for my transport node Uplink Profile, I'm using VLAN 170. For my edge node uplink profile, I'm using VLAN 171. Now, this was originally set up, if I go down to address pools, and I expand this out, and I go to the subnets, and I look at this, and I expand this out, the default gateway eventually was originally a .254 address. So, I'm not going to mess with this. 
because at least it's working. And the idea was to allow the overlay segment, let me go ahead and pull my topology back up. The idea was to allow the overlay segments, because when you're dealing with compute nodes and when you're dealing with edge nodes, two different VLANs. So you need to be able to provide that connectivity between the hosts. So right now everything's tied to CSR1. My goal was to point it to the HSRP VIP so that no matter which of the top of rack devices you were pointing towards, either one could respond. I could update that if I wanted to. It's I don't think it's going to make much of a difference here. But in order for any of the network adapter, any of the VM network adapters that are still tied to a VDS port group or a NSXT VLAN back segment that is using either the blue line here or this red solid line that connect to the CSRs, they're not going to be able to talk to any of the overlay segments at this point. And there, the reason for that is because the connectivity that we have in play. Now, I do want to preface that because of the way we have everything set up, one of the things we're going to run into a problem with is both the overlay segments and the VLAN back segments are using the same subnetting. I haven't changed that. So what I plan on doing when I go to bring connectivity to the, in from the outside world and do the VLAN back segments from both edge nodes to both CSRs and do the first step would be static routing and instead of static routes from the CSRs down to the edge nodes and the edge nodes to the CSRs, do a redistribution of static routes into OSPF so that the edge nodes have a default gateway that point to the CSRs. The CSRs will route the traffic to the rest of the network, all that good stuff that goes along with it. When all of those steps are in play, the next thing that needs to happen is the subnets that we were using for all of the VMs that were originally tied to the VLAN back segments and the VDS port groups, that IP addressing has to change. Now, we can do some things like you might have an IPAM solution where you flip it over to DHCP and you let it, um, the edge node provide a new range of addresses and stuff like that. So it's one of those things where there's probably no wrong way and or right way to do it. It's just we need to get the IP addressing changed. So it might be a step that you have to just take some downtime and do readdress all of your VMs that are going to be sitting there. Sometimes DHCP is the way to go. It depends on the situation. But nevertheless, for simplicity, I kept the same addressing. For future, we're going to have to change it because the VDS port groups and the SBIs that are configured, I'm sorry, the dot q subinterfaces, the router on the stick solution that we're using on the CSRs, they are using the same subnet range as the overlay segments. That's going to have to change. So what I'm going to do is I'm probably just going to use a different uh, range to go through and get that process in play so that we have a different IP addressing scheme. I'll do that offline because it's just going to be a pain for you guys to watch me re IP address a bunch of virtual machines. I'm not going to make you guys waste your time. So that's basically where that will come into play. So once we have that all squared away and dialed in, the edge nodes are deployed, they're good to go. And let me just verify a couple of things on that side real quick. Let me go back over here to close and let me go over to the system tab and the, pro, and the uh, nodes and the we can see that if we expand this out we can see that there's a bunch of tunnels set up between all of the hosts so 15 tunnels because we have virtual machines attached to all the overlay segments we need to have tunnels to everything and then the overlay and the edge transport zones we have 18 tunnels set up these are connections to all the other devices So as you can see here, we have a bunch of connections set up, all, a bunch of point-to-point -point connections with all the other devices. So we have uh, 171 to 170 going from, this is edge node 1 to edge, uh, ESXi2, ESXi2, ESXi2. We have a bunch of connectivity set up and across both of the fast path Ethernet interfaces. And then if we come down here, we have, we're connected two connections to edge node 2. So we have inter we have the connectivity up and running the way we need it to. And this is the connectivity I was telling you about where we're going to have a bunch of transport node tunnels set up to the edge nodes. And then the edge nodes are going to be where all of the, the routing happens. 
and all the connectivity goes into play with that. So when everything is squared away and operational, you'll see that this is the connectivity that you should see in your deployment model. And if you do, you're in good shape. Now, because when I set up the tier zero gateway to be in the, uh, the cluster to be in active standby, you'll notice that the logical router sits on edge node one. Edge node two only has two tunnels, two tunnels to edge node one. And then in the event that there's a failure or we need to fail over to edge node two, then all the tunnels would flip over to edge node two, which is why in this diagram right here, we are going to, technically speaking, everybody's terminating edge node one. This was drawn to be active active, but technically edge node one is hosting everything. So, and then just to verify the operations here real quick, let me go ahead and open up the host. The host should still be open, which they are. If I was to come in here and do a get logical routers, we're gonna see the uh, the logical, we have the, the DR. If I pull this out and do this guy right here, we should have three interfaces. And if I come in here, we have the connectivity up and running. And if I do interfaces, we're going to have a couple. We're going to have this guy right here, which is the overlay segment. And then we have another one, overlay segment. So we have all of our connection up and running the way we need to and all the connecting that's, that's there. Now, that's basically what we need to have in place in order for the rest of this stuff to work the way we need it to. So... At the end of the day, the connectivity is working. Now, just to, just to reiterate that the distributed router is going to get installed on the ESXi host and the edge node. So if we come back over here to the, the edge node, this thing timed out. But if I was to go in here and say restart session and log in as admin and the password, what you're going to see is, and this will take just a minute. Let me go ahead and bump up the um, the appearance real quick, just so it's easier for you guys to see. Let me go ahead and get out of the way. So here we're on the edge node. If I was to say get logical routers, you're going to see two VRs, two VRFs, one and two. VRF one is our distributed router. And then VRF2 is our service router. Their routing tables are going to look the same. The difference between the two is the distributed router is there for you to do inter-segment connectivity. And the this guy here is to do connectivity, all of the services, routing, load balancing, firewall, NAT, all of those capabilities happen on the service router. So if you are doing edge firewall, then it's going to be on the edge node. If you're doing distributed firewall, that's going to be happening on the ESXi host themselves. There's going to be a bunch of firewall rules that are pushed, and that's where the vSIP capability comes into play. We'll talk more about that in detail later, But because right now you've got get, and you've got the firewall is up here. Get firewall configuration, get, get load balance, or get logical switch. So you can get spoof guard, routing domains, managers, a vSIP SI, um, stuff like that. So... These are the capabilities that you're going to see as we move forward and start taking a look at this. If we do the firewall and we look at whatever's going on, you know, we can look at the uh, status, for example. And right now it's just enabled, right? The firewall capability is turned on. There's always firewall rules here, um, but there's not a whole lot of detail in them because nothing's really happening. If we were to go take a look at uh, rule-stats, and hit the enter key, we're going to see that there's rules here, and we can associate those to the rules in NSX Manager. So if I was to come over here and go to Security and Distributed Firewall Rule, and then expand these guys out, we're going to have Rule 2, 3, and 4. And if I look at this guy right here, that lines up, right? And we, if we want to know more about it, we can see Rule 2 is NDP. For network discovery protocol for IPv6, rule three is DHCP. Rule four is for default layer three rule. And we have a lot of bytes going back and forth, one session, one hit. So that's really where that comes into play. And you can, well, when we create more rules, we'll be able to see 
how they're installed at the host level and how that comes into play. And I'm not going to get too much further into the weeds on how that connectivity actually comes into play because the reality of it is there's a lot that we need to cover with the firewall piece. And right now is not the time for me to dig into it. So I just wanted to prove out that the connectivity is in place the way we expect it to be. And flapping the NICs usually seems to fix that. Now, one of the things I also want to point out to you real quick, let me go ahead and get out of the way again. Notice that Windows 2 and Windows 3 are powered off. Now, you might say, well, why is Windows 1 powered on? Well, the reason for that is because Windows 1 was online, connected to a VLAN back segment that had internet capability. Windows 2 and Windows 3 were added after the fact and joined directly to an overlay segment. None of the overlay segments have internet connectivity at the moment. They just have interconnect. Uh, we've enabled east-west east traffic inter-segment communication at the at the host level, and the next thing would be to do would be to get the external interface set up on the edge node, which I technically already have that done. If I come back over here, networking tier zero gateway, and I expand this out, we actually have a interface already configured. We have the T DC1 tier zero edge node one to CSR one connection. That's already working, right? That's already operational. So theoretically speaking, the only thing I have to do next would be to go to the edge node and configure a static route on the edge node to point to the CSR. And then the CSR point a static route from the CSR down to the edge node to reach all the internal communications there. And then on top of that, redistribute those static routes into OSPF to reach the internet. And then I'd be able to have internet connectivity and all that good stuff that goes along with that. I'm going to show you guys how to do that in the next video. Now, that's going to work. Like I mentioned in the, previous, uh, in, the, in the last video, we're starting off with a single tier routing architecture. Tier zero, doing the basics that we need to get up and running because that's really all that's necessary for us to do basic routing. But then as we get further along, I'm going to further complicate the design and walk you guys through what's needed, where, why, and how. All that good stuff that goes along with it. That's pretty much it for this video. I wanted to make sure that I could walk you guys through that process and do a little bit of troubleshooting, validate the connectivity, make sure everything's operational, how you can validate it at the host level. We're gonna to continue to do that stuff. So without any further ado, we're gonna go ahead and end this video. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, leave a comment in the comment section below. Please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch all of you guys in the next video.